I'm here today with Dina Sirnivasan. She's a fellow with the Thurman Arnold Project at Yale University, trained as a lawyer. She's worked in technology and developed advertising related technologies. Uh, she has been an advisor in recent years for people to understand the kinds of structures that the so-called large internet monopolies um, represent and what it pretends for society. Dina, thanks for joining me here today. Well, thank you for having me, Rob. Well, I think there's enormous amount of curiosity and concern. I think any time that technology and the whole way of life is transformed, uh, there, there's a transient period of anxiety, but particularly when the concentration of the entities in this information world becomes so fierce and so narrow and, and for that matter, so different. I know that you have done uh, work, uh, INET has covered, you've written papers for our blog uh, related to Facebook and related to Google, and you've published in scholarly uh, law journals, one at Berkeley and one at Stanford. Uh, why don't we discuss both over time, uh, over the course of this conversation, but at the outset, let's, let's talk about what do you see about Facebook and what it, how does it work and what cause for concern or perhaps uh, government intervention in the realm of antitrust uh, would, would, how would I say, address those concerns? Sure. So, you know, I, I sort of think of Facebook as sort of the 21st century communications utility. Um, folks don't really use landlines anymore. They talk on even mobile phones less. Um, and these social networks have really come up to take over the way that people communicate with each other and share things with friends and family and even colleagues. And um, before I really even started to think about antitrust in a very structured way when it relates to Facebook, one of the things that I thought a lot about was how is it, how is it that the people and consumers and citizens are okay with some of the terms that Facebook extracts from them? Now, we all think, oh, Facebook is free. We sign up for a Facebook account, and that's sort of been static for ages. Um, but, but actually, you know, in 2014, Facebook flipped the switch on one particular thing and one particular term, which I found totally fascinating. It used to be that when you sign up for a Facebook account, Facebook can, you know, use information that it gleans from your use of Facebook in order to target you with ads or to, you know, to just use that data and, and, and sort of the ways that it wants to use it. But what happened in June of 2014 is that sort of consumers that are now using Facebook are agreeing to have Facebook sort of survey their activity across the internet, um, across thousands and thousands and thousands of sites. So if I wake up in the morning and I read an article on the New York Times, Facebook can make a record of what it is that I read, what was the title of the article, um, when did I read it? And, and that felt like incredibly intrusive to me from, um, from a privacy perspective. And I became very curious as to sort of like, how is it, why is this a bargain that people actually like? Is it a bargain that people like? And how, how, you know, how did it, how did it come to be that this was the case? So I'm not sure if that answered your question, but that, that was sort of the, the origin of my interest in Facebook. So let, let's, I just wanted to kind of roll back in time. So the individual signs up for Facebook and it's a, I say, it's a delightful thing to be able to keep in touch with say your high school or college friends and your family that's now dispersed around the country and so forth. So you feel like you're getting, how would I say the ability to, shape private networks. What is it that you're also giving up that you're not being told you're giving up? 
So you're giving up, um, you're giving up privacy, right? You're giving up different levels of privacy. And it used to be one level of privacy when Facebook was competing with other firms in the market. Um, when Facebook entered the market in 2004, it promised users, we will not track you across the internet, right? Because in part, Facebook was trying to differentiate itself from, you know, the very privacy intrusive MySpace. MySpace was a disaster when it came to privacy. And as time moved on, Facebook tried to change that bargain with users, but you have this really long history of consumers pushing back and revolting and saying, no, we don't want you to track us across the internet, you know? And then Facebook saying, oh, okay, golly shucks, we won't do that. Um, and that and that sort of narrative went on for about 10 years until other social networks folded, went out of business, exited the market, and then Facebook could finally get users to consent to that. So to me, this looked like a very classic um, monopoly rent problem. It just wasn't coming in the form of, of you know, dollars and cents. Mm -hmm. And in essence, uh, I guess Facebook, first of all, doesn't or did not disclose what they were doing with the data. And secondly, it seems like for the data to be valuable, it needs to be what you might call large scale aggregation so that they're not, uh, how do you say, telling secrets on 25 people. They're creating clusters of big data that allow pattern recognition or uh, political parties to know which people they should reach out to for fundraising or not, all, all kinds of different things that might be what you might call uh, uh, parsed based on the data or based on the things that are being monitored. Is that, is that the right way of seeing it? Yeah, in part, you know, um, data is valuable, is valuable in as much as it's aggregated and crunched in, in aggregate ways like that. But one of the important things to understand and appreciate with Facebook is that it can correlate sort of uh, the stuff that you're doing with your real identity, because you have to sign up for a Facebook account using your real name. And so those data correlations are actually made at, you know, sort of a, um, a, a Dina Srinivasan level, right? They're, they're made at sort of the SSM level, practically. Mm -hmm. And uh, now have you seen, I, I would presume you have the film uh, Tristan Harris and others made uh, The Social Dilemma? I actually have not watched that in full yet. Uh, yeah, Tristan has been involved in a number of uh, INET events based in the Presidio in our California office over time. A lovely man and uh, very earnest, very interesting. He and Jared Lanier uh, and others, I thought, shed a lot of light on these approaching challenges at some of the forums that we've been fortunate enough to, uh, to organize under Pia Milani. Uh, the uh, uh, sense that I got in that film was that there are concerns related from all kinds of internet use related to brain development and things in children. And the second was the way in which the monitoring of your uh, data and your responses and what you chose to read allowed them to essentially characterize people and then sort out the stimulus so that, uh, how would I say, you were getting positive reinforcement for what you wanted to believe, not so much challenged or contradicted. And this would then boost enthusiasm spreading of the network, and ultimately increase advertising dollars. But as I think, uh, I, I saw this film quite a while back, but uh, there was some notion that by creating this filter bubble, as Eli Pariser wrote about, uh, you created this bifurcation that, quote, ran the danger of creating or fomenting a civil war in the United States, that by 
by re positively reinforcing people to energize their evangelism for joining the network and their participation in the network, uh, we were fomenting a divide that could be very dangerous politically. Yeah, definitely. I mean, I think that that sort of the elephant in the room with Facebook and other other large companies that rely on digital advertising for their revenue base is that you know they need they, they they need you to stay on the platform for longer and longer periods of time because they make more money the the more time that you give into the platforms and then they make more money based on you know the more that they um target content and target and target ads to you and that and that incentivizes them to basically collect more and more data so uh at this juncture, there are lawsuits that have been filed vis-a-vis -vis Facebook in a number of places. And uh, what what is the, what do people envision? Is the timetable or these uh, lawsuits things? I, I mean, I, I get the impression. I've talked a little bit to Roger McNamee and some others that uh, it's almost incomprehensible. Whereas there are a number of people, whether in law or in economics, trained in dealing with traditional monopolies, the novelty of the structure and the patterns and where the violations of social good occur, the kind of things that you have shed light on, uh, how would I say, they're not yet digested to the place where we, <laughs> where we understand in a court of law how to pursue right and wrong is do you do you sense that the world is ready to hear these cases i mean they, i feel a sense of urgency i feel an instinct but to make wise judgments and decisions is that is that in the offing i think we're totally ready to hear those cases i think the cases actually themselves do not present um, such novel questions of fact or law for, for courts and for judges. I think really the incredible thing and the really hard thing, which is now behind us, is actually the filing of the cases, right? Because you have to have a lot of, um, it, it's a lot, like you're filing a case that is novel and you're filing it really to, to in large part restore competition in order to restore, you know, better sort of products to consumers. Like, you know, you're, you're, you're filing these cases to restore for consumers communications channels that offer them greater levels of privacy. And so I think it's just an incredible thing that you have, you know, governments that are using tax dollars to wage these fights on behalf of the people for the benefit of their privacy. Uh, and I think that's where the really heavy lift was. You know, you can you can argue to a court, look, the the this company is a monopoly because it's big and it has a large share, and that's sort of a standard argument that you can make for Facebook as well. And then you you know you move on to the argument, well, this company is a bad monopoly and it's harming consumers because it charges monopoly rents, you know, it charges much higher prices. You can make the same argument when it comes to Facebook, but instead of saying, you know, it charges high prices, you say it's reduced the quality of its goods. Um, um, so, so there's sort of like very standard arguments that are being made, but they're just being made through slightly new lenses. Mm. Okay. Uh, and how, what, what took place then the question of what you might call mergers or acquisitions. Were there any stipulations made when WhatsApp was uh, acquired by Facebook or when they coupled with Instagram? Uh, do people see that as a, how do I say, a, a type of consolidation that reinforces the monopoly power or, or, is, or is that a different thing in this instance? Sure. So a lot of folks see the acquisitions that Facebook made of WhatsApp and Instagram as problematic from a monopoly perspective. 
you know, one of the things that I sort of grapple with here or that a lot of folks grapple with is, okay, suppose we break up Facebook from WhatsApp tomorrow. What is the world going to look like in 30 days, right? In 30 days or in 60 days or even in 90 days, the billions of people that have Facebook accounts will stay on Facebook and the billions of people that have WhatsApp accounts will stay on WhatsApp and they will have two accounts. They'll have a Facebook account and they'll have a WhatsApp account um, because the two products really are not interchangeable. Right? One is a messaging app, one is a social network app, and you use both. You don't use one or the other. So that is to say that even if you go after these mergers, um, consumers are still going to use both products after you break them up, and you're not really introducing choice or competition in the market. But the very good argument here on the flip side of this is that, yeah, but if you had other companies in the market, like if you had a separate Instagram and you had a separate WhatsApp, and they each had a user base of um, hundreds of millions or billions of users, those companies in the near future could decide to retool and compete with Facebook directly. And so it's that possibility of competition that could help the market, which is, which is why the, the, um, the cases are going after those mergers. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now, recently, uh... You've written a paper, as I mentioned at the outset, that INET helped support uh, related to the concerns about Google and particularly as it relates to the advertising model. And when I read your uh, article on the INET website and th looked through the paper, I, I saw that you drew analogies to the electronic trading world uh, in financial markets. Let, let's explore with our listeners uh, what what do you see? What is the structure and what is going on with Google that you chose to shed light on? So this story really begins in 2014. I was reading Michael Lewis's excellent Flash Boys book, and executives in the digital advertising industry were passing that book around and sharing it with each other, and then and then you know telling stories of you know oh ha ha you know this happens in our market too. And um, within, you know, amongst the business crowd, it wasn't such a spectacular thing that you had this thing in Flash Boys that was happening in the ad industry. But for me, with my sort of, um, I don't know, I was trained in law, you know, I was trained in, in competition issues and policy issues. And so I, I just thought it was fascinating. I was like, wait a minute, you know, the whole world is going crazy about this narrative in Flash Boys if it's happening in advertising and nobody knows and nobody's saying anything, that's crazy. You know, like that's really interesting <laughs> to have that just regulatory vacuum in the ads industry. And so last year when I was um, uh, sort of breaking down what to, or actually this was actually in the summer of 2019, what to research and write about next, I decided to take on sort of a, a comparison between the ad market and financial markets. And um, at a really high level, we're talking about the online advertising market. So we're talking about those online, you know, square box ads that you see when you log on to the news site, for example, you go to the New York Times, you pull up the site and there's a little box ad, you know, in the top right hand corner or at the top of the page. Those are called banner ads. And those banner ads today, um, the vast number of banner ads, maybe about 86% of the entire market in the US is traded in real time on centralized electronic trading venues that the industry calls ad exchanges. And the industry really migrated to electronically trading these things on centralized exchanges in around 2004 which is the same year really that the New York Stock Exchange migrated to electronic trading as well. Um, so you have you know, billions and billions and billions of ads which are changing hands on these centralized exchanges. And then the structure of the market from a broader perspective also looks very similar to financial markets in that buyers and sellers also have to go through a broker or middleman to trade on these exchanges. So if you're selling ad space, if you're the New York Times or another, another website or even an app, you have to go through um, a, a, an intermediary 
in order to sell your ad space on exchanges. Now, these intermediaries in the ads market have funky names like ad servers, but they're basically the same thing, right? Your ad server decides, all right, I'm going to route your ad space to this exchange. I'm not going to route it to another exchange. I'm going to route them sequentially to different exchanges. You know, they make decisions on your behalf about how to route space to exchanges. And then on the buy side, you have advertisers that also have to go through a middleman in order to buy ads on exchanges. So from a macro perspective, the structure of the market looks similar to the structure of financial markets. If you want to buy a share of Tesla, you know, you can't go knock on the door of the New York Stock Exchange. You have to go through, uh, you have to go through a broker. And so you have a selling broker and you have a buying broker. And then at the center is an exchange. And yet I recall from reading your work that sometimes all three were owned by Google. Exactly, exactly. And that's, and that's one of the fascinating things about this market um, and really would be a fascinating thing about any exchange market. Right. I mean, it's not just stocks and ads that trade on exchanges, but you know, you have other sectors of the economy as well um, that have migrated to electronic trading in this um, in this fashion. But to your point, yes. Yeah, so from almost any ad that you see, uh, you have a very very high likelihood that Google represented the seller and routing it to Google's exchange. It cleared on Google's exchange and. And Google was sort of on the buy side on behalf of the advertiser as well at the same time. And it's wearing all three hats at the same time. Mm -hmm. And the uh, under, other thing I remember when I read your paper that uh, unlike financial markets, the price of advertising for the buyer and the commissions for the exchange and the brokers is not transparent. It's not disclosed. Is that correct? So, um, it gets a little bit, it gets a little bit complicated. Um, but oftentimes what will happen, I'll just give you one example here at, 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 a, at a big picture level, there's a huge problem with transparency. And as we know with our experience regulating financial markets, when you don't have transparency, you combine trans lack of transparency with, you know, sort of ripe conflicts of interest in a complex electronically traded market and you have just disaster waiting, right? So, so you have the same thing in the ads market. And what, uh, one example is, for example, if you are a website, you're, you're selling your ad inventory and you're using Google on the sell side as sort of your broker. And by the way, Google has over 90% share on the sell side. So everybody uses Google on the sell side. And then let's say Google preferentially is routing that space to Google's exchange. So now it's clearing it on Google's exchange. Um, at the end of the day, Google's exchange gives data dumps back to the websites and it says, well, here's what your ads cleared for, right? This was the clearing price of all your goods. But when it does that, it's not necessarily disclosing that, oh, this car dealership paid X price um, for your ad and that was the clearing price on the exchange. The disclosure is at the buy side sort of broker level. So you know, what did Google pay on the buy side when it was wearing its buy side hat? What did Google pay for that ad on Google's exchange? And so you know what the ad cleared for you have transparency into the clearing price, but you don't have transparency into, for example, Google's margin um, hmm. when it's acting on the buy side. I know that, yes. that's very complicated. So so I know what I paid in gross, but I didn't know how it gets cut up between all the different intermediaries between there and the, and the end. Uh, that's interesting. Exactly. That's interesting. The... Uh, uh, now, I remember also from reading your paper that uh, over time, there's been a process where there used to be many exchanges. Uh, I remember Yahoo had one and there were others, but that's that's become, uh, how do I say, 
I guess what you might say, the volume dried up in some of them and they went out of business or, or left the business. And the Google exchange has become what I'll call, the, again, the natural monopolist. Have the prices and margins, uh, which I guess are not disclosed, so maybe I'm asking a foolish question, but have they come down? Have, is there a sense in which by uh, that natural monopoly getting all that kind of volume with economies of scale, is there is there any notion that the, that the price of the matchmaking service or the gross price for advertising has come down, or uh, or, or is that just too difficult to disaggregate and discern? No, I think I think actually the prices for um, at the exchange level have gone up, mm. and um, Google's exchange charges. Uh, more than other exchanges in in the space, and those margins have been incredibly and sort of um, very interestingly resilient to sort of any price pressure. But going going back to that that story, that story is really interesting. You know, how is it? You had a market where it started developing in two thousand and four, and you had Yahoo was operating the number one exchange in the space. I think Microsoft was operating the number two. You had lots of exchange competitors and Google decides to launch an exchange in 2009, like five years after the development of the market where you already have a bunch of players. And the question is, well, how, how did Google sort of enter a competitive exchange market in 2009 and very expediently just push out the competition, right? And, and the, the, the fascinating thing for me, at least with this Google research is you look at sort of all of Google's conduct in the advertising market and things look, um, things look random, you know, it's doing this and it's doing this and th that's the way it looked, you know, to me and it's doing this. And I never know how to make sense of it all. But after studying financial markets, you realize, oh, every single thing that Google was doing is something we prohibit in financial markets. It's not random at all. And so the way that Google's exchange sort of entered a competitive market um, tells one of these stories. So Google bought DoubleClick, which was the number one sell site broker. And then it adopted this rule, which said that you, when we're routing website space to an exchange, we're going to preferentially route it to our own exchange. Right. And not, not necessarily if the price is higher or better for the seller, but there are just these preferences of routing order flow to Google's exchange. And so because it controlled sort of the sell side, it was able to do that and starve other exchanges of liquidity. And they just, you know, they just went out of business. Uh, how would I say new technology world? The, another company that we see increasing in scale very rapidly <clears throat> is Amazon. Uh, it probably is a different type of model, but do you have peers or colleagues or people who are exploring the antitrust implications uh, of the growth of Amazon.com? Sure. I mean, I think Lena Khan's work here has been... Um, uh, really revolutionary in that regard. And are there similar kinds of stories or, or structures that are being revealed there? Uh, I, I, I get the impression that Amazon has many dimensions, not, I mean, they have, which you might call the retail at your door, or, you know, books and music and clothing and what have you. But, but I gather there are also, uh, how do you say, cloud systems and other things that they're in the market for, or market of providing. And uh, I, I was just curious as to whether there seems to be uh, uh, as, as much angst related to them as we're experiencing vis-a-vis -vis Facebook and Google. I think the angst is different, is definitely there. I think that the 
angst and sort of the economic puzzles presented by each of these companies is very different. You know, the market structures are very different. The, the, the things that they're selling are very different. The relationship with consumers are very different. So you have a different, you have a different set of, a different set of issues. However, I would say that there are some areas, there are some issues that tend to overlap. And one issue that tends to overlap that I think I spent, I've spent a lot of time thinking about and I think is just really interesting is around the use of data. Um, so when it comes to Google, when Google's operating the exchange or it's operating on the sell side, when it's basically wearing different hats, it doesn't keep customers' data, so the actual traders in the market, it doesn't keep their data, you know, cordoned off behind a wall for this use and then, you know, this data for this use. It tends to merge data behind the scenes and it can trade on that data, right? Now, because the ad market the structure of the ad market is so similar to the structure of financial markets, you can then look at that puzzle and understand the economic inefficiency behind it because you say, oh, well, that's just like insider trading, right? That's what's actually going on here. That's that's the economic problem. And um, so when it comes to Amazon, one of the things that came up, I believe it was last year, was around Amazon using the data of third parties to inform what products it should create, manufacture, sell, and how to sell it on its own platform, right? And so, whereas you have completely different businesses and different business models, that that's a conflict of interest problem. And it's a conflict of interest about, you know, you're wearing different hats and you're using data of your competitors to sort of sell your own products. And it feels like it's it's looking very similar to sort of this insider trading problem. Hmm. Yeah, I can imagine uh, the uh, the pressure. Let's say if you were a book publisher, to have to give Amazon the best price could be quite uh, how do I say quite quite powerful, quite quite uh, daunting in the sense that if you didn't do that they will play such a big role in the market that you're uh, i won't say dooming but you're impairing the quality of sales and back I, when i worked in music it was often the case that people would draw inference from sales uh these were the, this was the era of cds but if a cd looked like it was selling well then places analog to Barnes and Noble, Tower Records in those days, would all be incented to buy and put in the window these things that they knew were the, quote, hot products. And uh, it, it would be very hard now, I think, for a book uh, to be considered a hot product if it was aggressive in its pricing vis-a-vis -vis Amazon relative to other outlets. So there's, um, I could say, a lot of different dimensions. Dimensions. Let me, let me ask you a question. I know you've worked closely with our research director, Tom Ferguson, and he's very uh, deeply, uh, he's, a, he's a profound contributor to the role, to the question of the role of money in politics. And to my mind, one of the most striking things about this, say, modern era, we'll call it from the mid 1970s to the present, is the almost absence of antitrust investigation and, and enforcement. At this juncture, with highly concentrated wealth, large corporations treated as persons. Are we in a place where, which you might call the disincentive for an administration to enforce and investigate, bring to trial and enforce antitrust uh, has become, I would say that, that disincentive has become very strong for fear of losing donors or in the case of, of a Google 
or Facebook having very powerful high volume marketing instruments. I, I have this sense from Tom that in many, many respects, government, whether it's legislation, appointments, enforcement of existing rules are, let's just say, refracted by the maintaining the focus on building the war chest for maintaining one's position in elected office, whether it be the president or a speaker of the house or the head of the justice committee in the Senate or house. Uh, is, is there a sense, is my uh, intuition from reading Tom's work that the pursuit of antitrust might be somewhat less vigorous because of those of the awareness of the role of money in politics? Well, I would hope that the, uh, you know, the pendulum sort of s swung far enough in that direction. That's one of the reasons that maybe, I hope it is sort of bouncing, bouncing back. And, and, you know, at the end of the day, I don't know. I'm, I'm very, I'm very, um, hopeful that these antitrust issues and questions that have been raised against Google and Facebook and Amazon have drawn such bipartisan support. And so I guess I would say that that's good news, you know, and let's hope that that, that, you know, that type of good news continues because I think they present, you know, really macro sort of historic, historically important questions that are much bigger and much more important than than the issues you raised. What I'm curious uh, at this juncture going forward, can you share with us uh, what kind of next projects you envision? What, what kind of things are on your radar screen right now with your interest in antitrust uh, beyond Google and, and Facebook? Do you have other innovative platforms or, or environments that you would like to investigate? Well, I'm, I'm itching and yearning to figure out what's next. Um, one of the things that I do when I finish a project and, and to sort of figure out what to do next is I, is I try to just clear my calendar as much as possible and take a step back and read on um, I read all the papers to sort of have one leg in current events and have different perspectives of current events. But then I just, you know, um, read uh, a stack of economics books that I have on my agenda to read. And then I try to start reading a little bit of fiction again. Um, and, I, and, and then that, that, that sort of stage lasts a while and I, I think of something else. But I'm still in that stage, so I don't know. But I would imagine that it, it's still going to fit in the bucket of um, uh, of uh, research and, and sort of writing and 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 then you know trying to to work on these issues in a real world way to effectuate change. I'm just knowing you're working with the Thurman Arnold Project at Yale. Have you read his book, The Folklore of American Capitalism? Or I guess it's Not. called The Folklore of Capitalism. That's quite a good read. I remember reading that when I was a graduate student. And uh, it it really got under the skin of some of these questions about concentration of economic power. And uh, I thought that was, a, how do I say, I, I don't know. I don't even know if it's still in print. I think it'd be quite interesting to, uh, how do I say, in light of the pathway that you're on to uh, visit his thinking and, uh, and some of the, how to say earlier, what I'll call progressive approaches to antitrust enforcement. Though, as you've pointed out nicely in your research, these, these are different structures. It's not the traditional model. I think that, um, how would I say the, the final thing that I really want to emphasize for our listeners is the 
extraordinary contribution of people like yourself. We are all, as H.L. Mencken wrote about in his famous 1920s article, The Dismal Science, he said that all social analysts and economists are mindful, or intuitively mindful, perhaps, of the ramifications of challenging power. And many people, I know Julian Tett, who's on the board of INET, works with the Financial Times, once told me that you should study the, what's not said because the map of the silences tells you where power is. And what I'm coming to is that you have chosen in your own career as a mother of four children, as a citizen, to illuminate and to challenge what these new structures are doing or could do, both positive and negative, for the quality of our lives. And there are some very concentrated and powerful interests that H.L. Mencken would point to that are on the other side of that. So I guess what I'm trying to say in a long-winded way is thank you for the courage that you exhibit, for your perseverance, for the intensity of your intellect, and and how I say, lo looking these challenges right in the eye. That You are an example. My young scholars should pay very close attention as they're developing their careers, because you are an example of someone who is providing for the public good. And uh, I, I really want to applaud that. Well, thank you so much, Rob. That was just so generous. Yeah, uh, I, how would I say? I think we need more of that right now. There are a whole lot of things that are changing. There are a whole lot of things being unmasked. And in addition to the illumination that you create, the example that you create, is a, how would I say, a call to action for the rest of us to pick up and embrace our work in social science in a similar manner. So any last thoughts that you'd like to, uh, to share with the audience before we sign off? It's been a pleasure talking to you. Thank you so much for having me and, and thank you for doing all of these uh, podcasts. I really enjoy listening to them. It's my pleasure, and I feel I'm very grateful that you could make the time. And uh, I hope at some point in the not too distant future, as these uh, issues continue to unfold and you continue to illuminate them, that we might uh, join again and uh, and do another episode of Economics and Beyond. That Thanks. Like a plan. Excellent. Bye bye for now. Bye bye. And check out more from the Institute for New Economic Thinking at ineteconomics.org.